leave the tags on it so you can return to Walmart if you leave. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So if you have any questions at any time, please stop me. There's a very small group, so I'll probably make eye contact and say, and I'll also come up and grab pizza because I'm not going to eat all of it. Alright, so my, again, my name is Ben. I'm a physics graduate student here. I'm getting my PhD graduating in May. Uh, so if you have any questions about that process, that's probably what I'm going to cover tonight. So the first problem that I'm going to address in this talk is not knowing what's even available. So how many of you here know after you get your bachelor's and graduate, what happens next? Just a raise of hands, who knows what's going on? Quite a few, so well, more than half. Alright, so for example, the question, how do you get the doctor in front of your name? This is something I didn't think about in, in college, so it kind of screwed me over in the short term. But like all the professors here are doctor so-and-so, right? So how do they get this in front of their name? That's the requirement I covered. So the, the, the idea is you have to determine what there is to know in the first place in order to learn it. This is a very difficult concept because you sort of not even know what to learn. And the kind of the downfall of school here is that Everything, all these subjects, these classes, they're explicitly telling you what it is you need to know because it's going to be on a test, and they're telling you, you know, what you have to learn. Thank you. So you're not really given the go ahead. There's, you're not really given the skills here of learning how to learn or like knowing what there is to learn, and so it's it's a little bit hard to understand maybe this idea. Does everyone kind of get what I'm talking about? Yes. No. Anyone say no? All right, so the idea is. You've gone through this formal education for many years already. You've gone through kindergarten, elementary, middle school, high school, and now you're in college. And so you're getting older and older, and you're staying in school. Now you're in college, all right? What this gives you, if you haven't thought about it too much, is actually just a brief overview of the discipline of physics. So you're not actually going into the forefront of physics yet. You're just covering everything that's known at a very shallow level. And so uh, something unique about college, you are paying tuition. You didn't do this in high school. Uh, you may or may not be doing graduate school next. And an important thing that I always harp on is opportunities for research. It's kind of a very unique time in your life where you can hop around from graduate school or from advisor to advisor and you can look at different research abilities. This is very uh, useful and hopefully we're all aiming for our bachelors, although not everyone may get there. So the point that I want to make with this timeline here is that you go, you've already made transitions between different points in your life. Right? And probably the most recent transition that y'all went through was high school to college. So there in high school, remember, there were some people who dropped out, maybe a pretty significant portion. Most of them got their G GED or high school diploma, and some of them even started working. But you all went through this process of searching for a school, applying for that school, and in that process, you had to demonstrate in your application that you were a leader, right? doing something with the community. Maybe having a nice GPA is helpful. Right? And then you need letters of recommendation from people who know you pretty well. And then there were some standardized tests, the SAT, ACT. Everyone took those? Yes? I think those are still required mostly. And then you got into college. Uh, but there's the same process goes on for the next transition after college. So right now you're getting your bachelor's. If you want to continue on in science, in physics, you have to go to another school called graduate school, which is what I'm in now. The same process applies. But notice in high school, there's kind of this common knowledge that college was coming next and you had to prepare for it and apply all this process. For some reason, it's not as widely advertised in college that there's school after this called graduate school. And so again, you need to search multiple different schools. They may have different specializations. Like for instance, there are some schools that are not as widely known but are good in physics, like Urbana-Champaign is a good school in physics, it turns out, although they're not as widely known as say Yale or Princeton. So you need to seek advice about these, talk to your professors, people who are going through this process, and then there's the application process. And associated with that, there are deadlines right, that you have to know about. So it's, it's useful to start thinking about this before you graduate, because by then it's a little bit late. Again, so the SBS officers here have already demonstrated that uh, being an organizational leader will look good on the application. Right? They've gone through this process. The reason it's useful is because you demonstrate organizational skills. You demonstrate the ability to lead people, communicate, and all very nice things that people want to see. Again, the GPA 3.5, it's it's kind of a standard of that's cut off, but I got in lower than that, so you never know. But there's a recommendation. This requirement here implies that you need to have three, at least three good relationships with advisors or professors who can say, I took this this person was in my class, they've done research with me, I know them to be a good person and a smart, motivated, and bright, all these good things that they want to know about you. So develop these relationships is important. And then 
you'll see some older people, maybe not in college, obviously, and not professors, they're kind of like me, right? They're a little bit older than, than you suspect college students to be, and these are graduate students wandering around. And so you can always ask them for advice, because they're, if you ask, do you have time to talk about graduate school? And they'll be happy to talk your ear off, because they have lots of opinions. And you can also ask professors, right? Now this might be a little bit intimidating, because professors have more power than you, but at the same time they have much more experience, which you can take advantage of. And so you can ask these people for advice, you can just walk in and say, do you have time to talk about this issue? I'm interested in continuing on in physics, how do I do it? Right? They'll have lots of advice, because they've gone through it, obviously. So uh, there are people with knowledge, take advantage of that. And then there's a standardized test called the GRE. Uh, Laura, probably the most recent person to take that. I met other people. I don't know as much about that. But uh, so now there's this transition basically then, trying to make you aware of if you're in college and you have your physics degree, what do you do with it, right? You could maybe teach high school, you could get into some work, not specifically physics related though, probably. And then you, you get your bachelor's and if you don't, you need to drop out. So, the idea is, if you want to stay in physics, there's school after this called graduate school. It takes another four to five years. Do you have any questions on that? Yeah, yeah. Now, if you go into graduate school, what do you do? Right? Are you taking just more classes? The answer is yes, you do. There are more classes to take. Just basically a repeat of statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics, uh, <coughs> all the things you took as an undergraduate, but just a little deeper, more mathematical level. And for whatever reason, I, I don't get this. If someone can explain this to me, I'd really appreciate it. For some reason, when people think science, they think experiments, which is perfectly valid. I mean, that is a third of science, but as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned, but, like this is the main thing people think about. So in addition to classes, you're doing research, and research can be broken down into experimental, which is what everyone thinks of. And then there's also two other areas in physics, which I want to emphasize that maybe people aren't as excited about for some reason. Not sure why. There's theoretical, which is about how do you guide these experiments with the math, right? How do you actually make predictions about what these research is going to be doing? That's pretty heavily math. And then there's the computational side, which is what I do. I'm a computational physicist, which means instead of running my math programs on one computer, I run 20,000 CPUs at once. And so we're doing math that the theoreticians couldn't do in the chalkboard. So this is where I come in. And so in any of these three positions, this is how you get through graduate school in addition to the classes you're taking. So the difference with college, there you are paying tuition and just scraping by somehow making a living. But in graduate school, you probably get paid with a stipend. And so you'll either be doing research, it's a research assistant, so the professor will be paying for you to do research and they'll be covering your tuition and your living expenses. Although just as a side note, I earned less than the federal income level for property this year. Just keep that in mind. So when they say you're paying you, you're not earning a living really, you're just scraping by. Another position, a teaching assistant, like all the undergraduate labs here are taught by graduate assistants. And so this is another way the department is paying us to teach courses. And then two less traveled routes, I'm not sure why, but maybe they're just harder. There's a fellowship, let's say you apply for money from someplace outside of the campus, and they'll pay you to do research. This is very nice because it means you don't have to teach and you don't have to be uh, sort of constricted to one advisor for research. So you can hop around things a little bit easier, you have a little bit more freedom. So a fellowship is pretty nice. There's some links here that I'll be giving this presentation after the talk to you guys and you can follow that. The Crowell Institute is where that is. And then the last one is work agreements. This is, uh, for some reason, I didn't even realize this was possible until it was too late, but I want to get the word out to you guys. Did you know that Wherever you want to work, like let's say the San Diego National Lab, they'll pay you to get a master's degree, and they'll pay you to get a PhD. Is that awesome? <laughs> you can't really beat that. Plus, think of it, after you graduate, you have a guaranteed job, right? They want to get you in their place <coughs> educated. So this is really nice. So if you can swing it, find some place where you want to work, ask, hey, will you pay for my graduate school? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. So think about that opportunity. Uh, usually, like a government lab or a large industrial, like obviously not a startup is going to pay for your master's degree, but uh, so just large places might pay for your graduate education. So, uh, some advice, some kind of tidbits that I've learned in graduate school that I want to pass on before I get out of here. One of the things that you can be, you can kind of distinguish yourself from all the other students, right? You, you're going through with a group of students who are being given the same training, given the same opportunities. So, when you get out, 
how are you going to distinguish yourself from those people? <coughs> You're competing with them. And so one thing you can do is you can pay attention to email lists, like there's campus email lists, but probably a bit more significant here would be like the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. What that gives you is uh, some information outside of your domain. So even though I'm a physicist, I'm on these, like for the Association for Computing Machinery, they list conferences, they list uh, webinars, they list uh, opportunities for you to improve yourself outside of physics. And this is really nice because it gives you skills that other people in your, with your degree might not have. So this is one way of expanding. Just remember, that the idea is you have to know what there is to learn. And one way to do that is kind of get outside of your bubble that everyone else is being given that same information, get something else, get something people don't have. Another resource that I didn't take advantage of until very recently, Read books in your area, right? If I'm going to be getting a, I'm going to be Dr. Ben basically in a few months, and so the idea there is, then people expect me to actually understand physics, right? This is really scary. <laughs> They'll be like, like, don't you know this? I'm be like, well, I, I don't know, <laughs> right? So the, there are these nice books like History of Physics by Asimov. There's Short History of Nearly Everything by Bryson. These books cover everything in physics, all the history, everything you need to know, on a very easy to read uh, level. It's not really fiction. But it reads like fiction, unlike a textbook or a journal article, which is harder to read. So these books are pretty nice. They kind of condense everything into a book that you can read it in a month or so. The last thing about here is participating with people. So half of research, in my opinion, is doing research, right? Like being a good researcher, doing cool experiments, doing the computers, doing the math, knowing having these skills. That's half of it, right? Does anyone want to guess what the other half is, in my opinion? Right, well, not just working at company, but like actually developing social skills, right? So you have to do the research, but you have to communicate to other people you're doing the research. This is something, for some reason, that's not very well emphasized, I think, in, in physics education is you're really skilled, right? You've got all these, these knowledge of useful things, but you can't tell anyone else. I mean, that kind of screws you over, right? It's the same as not having the information in the first place. So develop social skills to communicate what you're doing with your peers and other outside of your bubble. So networking at conferences is one aspect of that, where you can actually interact with people who may not understand what you're doing specifically, but they have the technical background too, so you have to be able to talk to them. So there's an APS March meeting, which is for condensed matter. There's Frontiers and Optics. These are different conferences you can go to. And then a little bit more general, not so specific to physics, but finding mentors is obviously useful. So when I'm on my, getting my PhD, I'm assigned a set of five professors who will be my alumni committee. And they'll kind of guide my research, guide what I'm doing. I can go to them for advice. I can go to other people. These are what I would call my mentors. And then, obviously, being able to communicate is a just generally useful skill. It doesn't matter where you are. Navigating political structures. SPS officers can already tell you. You're going to be interacting with people you may not agree with. You're going to be organizing people. You're going to be not manipulating people, but just guiding them towards a centralized goal. Right? This is Manipulation, but SPS officers already do this for you. So this is good experience to have outside of physics. Travel grants. I just want to advertise that. Take the opportunity and time to apply for travel grants. So in in my I think five trips I went to Sicily, Chile, uh, Seattle, Lake Tahoe, Boston, all over the world on what? Just some writing skills. Right? So I applied for travel grants. It's a pretty low probability of success, but if you're a good writer and you can communicate well, right, then you can convince people, hey, you should actually pay me to travel to some foreign country and talk. Right? So this is really nice. So apply to travel grants, keep your ears perked up. These come across these email lists that I mentioned earlier, and they're pretty nice because uh, you can list it in your resume, like someone paid me to go to a country, and it's pretty good. And then uh, this last aspect here, when you're doing research and you're talking with other people, the only way that you actually get into the record is to publish papers, right? But the other aspect of publishing papers and writing papers is that it crystallizes how you're thinking. So this may be a little bit early in your career, but uh, can you, you agree? have you written papers yet? Has anyone here written any papers? What kind of paper? Like a journal article, published in Pizzo. Okay. So the idea here is when you publish papers, it's not just recording all the things you did and thought about, but it actually forces you to crystallize your thoughts and convey them to other people. And this stimulates your own thinking. So. All right. Now, <laughs> on the dark side, maybe at graduate school, think of it this way: you're all bachelor's students, right? You're getting a bachelor's of science, but 
think of, you can th probably think of someone who's smarter than you, right? I can do that. And you can think of someone not as smart as you, right? And so when you get out of here, which with your bachelor's of science, that means that you'll all have the same degree, but you won't have the same level of experience or knowledge or education. So that same thing carries over to PhDs in graduate school. It's no different. There's a distribution of intelligences, which means when I get my doctorate, right, there are going to be doctors who are smarter than me and doctors who are less smart than me. And for whatever reason, I found that people treat doctors as like some equally qualified unit. It's really not the case. So doctors just imply persistence because you've been in school for so long. That's all I really can tell you. Alright, now <laughs> here's the really depressing news, alright? You've just gone through five years of graduate school after college, alright? You're almost in your mid-30s now. There's more school after that. <laughs> so, is everyone, was everyone aware of that? Is everyone, yes, no, no? Alright, so this is the point. You've gone through five years of graduate school, and in order to really polish your physics skills, you need another two or three years of postdoctoral experience. Again, this is where I'm at now. There's the search process, figuring out where you can go, and there's the application. It's not actually school, you won't get some certificate, it's just additional training after graduate school. And so, uh, this is just, uh, like I said, polishing on top of your skills. And so again, you need to demonstrate that when you're applying here, you were a leader, you can manage people, these are useful skills, you can write proposals, remember those travel grants, travel grants give you experience writing. And then transferable skills, this is something that, uh, as far as I can tell, they don't even teach in graduate school. When they, I'm doing research, think of what I'm doing. I'm doing, writing computer programs, I'm writing up papers, right? But prob probably what will happen in postdoctoral position is that there won't be my specific research focus. And so what that means is I'm going to have to have skills that are useful outside of my narrow research focus. So these are what I'm calling transferable skills, something that other people can find useful outside your research. And again, there's this 3.5 GPA, which is always nice to have. That is a recommendation. Hopefully you've developed some good, strong connections with advisors. And then the last thing which I found actually to get, I applied to I think more than 100 positions right, from this postdoctoral application process. And I've got six offers. All six offers are a result of cold calls. Does anyone here know what a cold call is? Yeah, okay, so a cold call is you find someone on the web who's doing interesting work and you think, hmm, maybe they could find me useful. You find their phone number, you profile them, you see what their dissertation was, you find what papers they published, kind of what they're working on, and you just call them up. Right? This is kind of takes some cojones because you have to have the confidence to say, look, I'm a cool person, you're doing interesting work, uh, hire me. Right? So <laughs> this is how I've got six offers. Not those 100 electronic applications, but the six offers just came from cold calls, maybe like 20 different calls. Calling up and saying, look, you should hire me. So the conversation went, uh, I'm interested in working as a postdoc position. I see you have one listed. What can you tell me about your research? And then after that, I will tell you uh, what my research skills are and why I think you should hire me. So just going through this, you put together this proposal, and then you get grants, and it all goes from there. Now, let's see. Now you can actually start working, right? You're about 33, 35. You've got a family, right? You can actually start working. So <laughs> the sad news is. You won't be earning as much as the people on Wall Street, right? You're not going to be raking in three hundred thousand dollars probably, but you get to continue on in physics. In my understanding, there's kind of three distinctions. There are these uh, careers which are in physics, doing research, which are a bit more competitive than the other option in that you're competing against other smart people, and the career isn't as as uh, robust or, or secure. So the first one, which everyone thinks of because you've been exposed to these professors, right? You could work at a school, at a university, teaching, doing research. So you can get a tenure track uh, professor position. There's a, a book on that you can read. There's research, which is what I'm aiming for. You can go to national labs. Does anyone here know how many national labs there are? No? Okay, so there's, I think, at least 15 different distinct national labs. They're all. Large, you can think of them as large corporations which just do research and are funded by the government. Right? And so there's Sandia, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, Los Lindemar, Lawrence Berkeley. And there's another group of labs, the Army lab, the, or the military labs, which is the Army, Air Force, Navy. Each of them have their own research labs. And I've got offers, two offers from the Army research labs. There's a, one from here, and two from here, and one from there. So uh, this is because I'm an American citizen, right? 
these people are more interested in hiring me because I can get security clearance and uh, there's not as much visa problems. So that's kind of something to keep in mind. And then there's Santa Fe Institute. There are these very <laughs> rare uh, private organizations like Santa Fe, which just do research, and they're kind of hard to get into. And then there's industry, which you could actually make some money. For instance, D.E. Shaw, uh, IBM, making chips, uh, computer software, Lockheed, Boeing, Google, these are all places that want to take advantage of your research abilities. Now, the last bit here is a non-physics career. Even after you've gone through grad, you've gone through college, you've got your bachelor's, you've got postdoc, or sorry, you've gone through graduate school, you've got a master's, probably a PhD, and you did postdoc, it's kind of silly to think of it, but you could still go into a non-physics career after all of that with your research experience. The issue here is uh, it may not be as competitive once you get in, because once you get into a government job, you're there, and it's less likely to get fired. You don't have to compete as hard, so it's just something to keep in mind. And even though these aren't physics, it's important to know that they exist because you shouldn't discount the, the opportunities there. So you still may apply to these. So the government agencies, of course, NSA, DHS, CIA, I mean, every three letter combination you can think of has a government association with it. And so you can just apply to any of those. The trick there is to say almost all need security clearances, and all of you are American citizens, I'm assuming. So that's good to go. And then uh, policy, you can, you can apply your knowledge to the, cap, the people on Capitol Hill, like policymakers, and they actually need some sort of information other than just money being thrown at them occasionally. So and then there's think tanks who are trying to influence the policy. There are many people who are smart and know what's going on. And then the last, like maybe farthest from physics, I would say, the non-governmental organizations, the Red Cross, ACLU, EFF, there's different places that weren't smart people, but you may not be doing physics research necessarily. So to summarize, uh, there's so you've gone through lots of school. By this chart, you're maybe halfway through. <laughs> so how many people here actually are interested in continuing in physics in the long term? Right, so yeah, and where do you best do you want to go? Just out of curiosity, what, what do you want to do after this? <clears throat> kind of, I think it's kind of weird, but I kind of kind of want to go into maybe some mission work. Some what? Uh, mission work. What is that? Oh, mission. Oh yeah. Okay. And you? Um, I also have a double E degree, so I'll be doing it in the works. Okay, so you can get right into industry then. Yeah, okay. So this is kind of the flow if you're trying to stay in physics, basically. So does anyone have any questions? Not? I'll say thank you. Uh, it's very good uh, for you inviting me here, and thank you for uh, hosting me.